and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. This is the podcast where we pick six movies all related to a single theme. And then on each episode, we take one of those movies and give you some behind-the-scenes history on who made the movie and why it was made in its place in cinematic history. Then, on top of all that, we give you a full review of the movie from opening to closing credits. I am one of your hosts, Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we are in the thick of season 20's theme, Bombs Away. This is episode three, and much like episode two, we're going to spend the majority of this episode on the planet Mars. That's right, this episode features the sci-fi fantasy film, John Carter, a movie that dares you to understand what's going on at any given time. This movie has dream sequences inside flashbacks that are nested inside other flashbacks. Every character has a name that's difficult to pronounce, challenging to spell, and impossible to remember. Somehow the author of the book that the movie is based on is a character framing device. I think the main character has superpowers? I know there's a fat dog that's got superpowers. Hey, and I know that Mr. Bo Ransdell has some knowledge that he wants to put in your ear holes to make you smarter than you already are. So let's get Bo in here to formally introduce us to the movie known as John Carter. Bo, uh, take it away. When you're talking about bombs, you can usually smell a disaster in the making. Cutthroat Island was a mess of a production, people kept dropping in and out of the cast, and even the director and star were trying to get out of the thing. Mars Needs Moms, well, that was a somewhat obscure children's book, done in an animation style the public had voted against with their lack of attendance on earlier examples, and that seemed like a foregone conclusion. But John Carter was different. This was supposed to be a big Disney hit with a hot director enthusiastic about the project and no major behind the scenes drama to forecast the failure. So what happened? John Carter is based on the first Edgar Rice Burroughs Mars novel entitled A Princess of Mars, published as a serial in 1912. Those serialized chapters were then collected in 1917. Burroughs is most famous for his creation of Tarzan the Ape Man, a collection of shockingly racist tales of a white European dude who becomes a hero for intelligent apes and black Africans alike. But this was the early 1900s, and shockingly racist was sort of the vibe. Still, Burroughs' work was wildly popular, and his Mars stories, a planet he called Barsoom in the pulp novels he wrote, were very popular, if not as popular as Tarzan. These Mars books, written by Burroughs, were Star Wars before Star Wars, filled with strange creatures, heroes rescuing princesses, and a lot of eugenics talk on account of Burroughs being a big believer in the theory. Fun fact, the Nazis were also big believers in eugenics, which, if you didn't know, was the belief that you could weed out bad behavior by sterilizing or killing people who exhibited traits you didn't like. Burroughs was especially fond of the idea that criminal behavior was hereditary, and you can find all kinds of fun examples in his stories of races of people who have bred out evil in pursuit of their own utopias. But despite the author being a nightmare of a human being, these Mars stories were both popular and influential, and work began to turn the books into movies way back in 1931, when a director best known for Looney Tunes animation, Bob Clampett, wanted to turn the stories into an animated feature. Early tests were poorly received, but there is a world in which A Princess of Mars was the first animated feature film and not Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Ray Harryhausen wanted to take a stab in the 1950s, not long after Burroughs' death, but couldn't get others excited about the project, and then Disney put together an attempt in the 1980s when Jeffrey Katzenberg was heading development. Disney was looking to make a hit movie that was a live action to sit alongside their animated work, and especially if it was one that could give them a long-running franchise. Writers were hired to adapt the material, including Charles Pogue, who had done the remake of The Fly for David Cronenberg, Terry Black, who said Disney wanted this to be the next Star Wars, and even Ted Elliott and Terry Russo, who would write the animated hit Aladdin, and later The Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Now, by the time the 1990s rolled around, 
Disney still had no script they could stake millions on. Enter John McTiernan, the guy who directed Die Hard and Predator in The Hunt for Red October. He then hired screenwriter Bob Gale, best known for the Back to the Future movies, to combine elements of the earlier drafts of the scripts and add in a little bit of humor. McTiernan plucked one of the Imagineers from Disney, a guy named William Stout, to start drawing up designs for the creatures in the world of Barsoom. In 1992, McTiernan also added a writer named Sam Resnick he liked, and Tom Cruise was loosely attached to play John Carter, while Julia Roberts was interested in the part of Deja Thoris, the titular Princess of Mars. But McTiernan was frustrated. He couldn't quite figure out how to make this alien world feel real. This was before a little movie called Jurassic Park proved that you could do some pretty amazing things with computer effects. So, McTiernan left the project and went on to do The Last Action Hero, which was also a bomb, but only because people are dumb and don't know a good thing when they see it. Carol Co., a company we talked about going bankrupt after Cutthroat Island, held the rights to Burroughs' book, and when they went belly up, the rights floundered. Paramount ended up snagging the book with the help of this can't be right, Harry Knowles of Ain't It Cool News, and gave the directing nod to Robert Rodriguez from a script by Mark Potrosevich, who did that first underwhelming Thor movie. Rodriguez wanted to use digital effects to essentially bring to life some of the artwork he remembered on the pulp novel covers done by legendary fantasy artist Frank Frazetta, who did pretty much every fantasy cover you remember being cool. Unfortunately, Robert Rodriguez had recently resigned from the union, the Directors Guild of America, over a fight with them about his movie Sin City, and Paramount was not too crazy about the idea of making a non-union movie, so Robert Rodriguez was given the boot. He was replaced by a guy named Kerry Conran, who had just finished Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, a retro-futurist movie that could have been cool if it hadn't been dull as dirt. So flash forward to 2005, and Princess of Mars was no closer to production, and Kerry Conran jumped ship too. Paramount then tapped an unlikely duo director John Favreau and a writer named Mark Fergus. John Favreau proposed using a combination of digital effects and practical, and wanted to pluck bits from the first three Mars novels into a great big epic film. Paramount wasn't so sure about this, and eventually let Favreau and Fergus go, who stepped over to another movie, Marvel's Iron Man. Paramount was really frustrated by the lack of progress on this project, but one man was eager to tackle it. A legitimate visionary named Andrew Stanton, who was the second animator ever hired for Pixar. When he began work there, Pixar was just a subsidiary of George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, which was then purchased by Apple to develop graphics for Max, but Pixar creatives envisioned the business as an animation studio. Stanton was the guy who helped see the script for Toy Story, Pixar's breakout hit, through the troubled times of pre-production to deliver a movie that was game-changing for Pixar and the movie industry at large. Stanton went on to co-write Toy Story 2 and Monsters, Inc., and he helmed Finding Nemo, which he also wrote, along with Wally. -E. He was a can't-miss filmmaker, at least until John Carter came along. Andrew Stanton was looking for something else, a movie that would get him off the Pixar treadmill and allow him to spread his wings creatively. He was also a fan of the Edgar Rice Burroughs Mars novels and had kept tabs on various incarnations of the story as it wound its way around Hollywood. It was after he heard that John Favreau's version of the film collapsed that Stanton thought he might be just the guy to take the reins and finally lead John Carter to Mars. Since he had a relationship with Disney thanks to his work with Pixar, Stanton went to Disney's top executives and sold them on the idea of the John Carter books as the next big thing, a sci-fi and fantasy franchise just waiting for the right combination of talent and ambition to bring it to the big screen. And even before the popularity of Game of Thrones and the like, Stanton saw the Mars books as a franchise, a series of adaptations that could go on for years, and Disney took the bait. So they needed a new writer to bring Andrew Stanton's vision for John Carter to life, and as fate would have it, another fan of the books was ready to take on this challenge. Screenwriter Michael Chabon 
had written a loose interpretation of the Burroughs Mars books in the 1990s when he penned a script called The Martian Agent. Jan de Bont was signed on to direct that movie, but then a little movie called Speed 2 happened, and suddenly Jan de Bont was not being handed big tentpole pictures to direct anymore. And so, Michael Chabon was at a party at Brad Bird's house. Brad Bird is best known for his work on Ratatouille and The Incredibles for Pixar, and at that party, Chabon got word that Andrew Stanton was in line to direct an adaptation of Princess of Mars with Disney putting their weight behind it. According to Chabon, the party was on a Friday and he spoke excitedly with several Pixar alums there about his enthusiasm for the John Carter books. On that Monday, Andrew Stanton called him up and asked him about his former script, The Martian Agent, and would Chabon like to come by Stanton's office and see what they were up to with John Carter? Well, of course he would. He was very curious about what Disney was doing with John Carter, and he met Stanton at the pre-production offices. At the end of the tour of the offices and a look at some of the early artwork for the movie, Stanton turned to Chabon and asked, So, you want to go to Mars? Stanton went to work assembling the best talent around for his movie. Nathan Crowley was brought on to be production designer for this movie to bring the world of Barsoom to life. And Crowley had recently worked on The Dark Knight and Batman Begins for Christopher Nolan, and he was joined by Michael Giacchino, a Pixar composer of films like Up and Jurassic World and Spider-Man Homecoming, and about a million movies you've seen. Then there was Dan Mendel, who would shoot the movie, and had gotten some attention for his cinematography on J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot, among many others. As a team of super talented creatives were assembled, it was time to start making some decisions. The first was in the look and the feel of the movie. Rather than the violent, hyper-masculine world of the novels, Stanton wanted to move away from the Frazetta-esque fanboy vision of John Carter. Quote, It's very sexist and it's very male, he said in an interview, and I just didn't see the need for that. I think you can find the individuals just as attractive and a different definition of sexy or romantic without having to be naked and gratuitous in this Frazetta look. So, with a less extreme tone set for the movie, then came the big decision. Who would play John Carter? Stanton says they saw just about every male lead in Hollywood, but they kept coming back to Taylor Kitsch, an actor best known at the time for his work on the popular television series Friday Night Lights. It was a tough part because of Carter being, you know, a Confederate soldier. And Stanton said, I wanted not to absolve him of that, but also not make him pro the side he was on. The best I could do was neutralize him and just make him disillusioned by everything he had chosen to do, war in general, let alone the wrong side. Mmm, okay. And while Taylor Kitsch was the early favorite, an older actor who had circled the part years before rose up again, mummy-like, to throw a wrench in the works. Tom Cruise heard about John Carter getting ramped up again, and he wanted that role. He pressed Stanton hard for it, but Stanton refused to budge only agreeing that if Taylor Kitsch passed, Cruz would be favored to replace him. Lynn Collins, who played the Princess of Mars herself, Deja Thoris, said as much, but suggested Cruz might have thought he had more of an end than he did, especially considering everyone in the cast was about 20 years younger than him. The next year after John Carter, Cruz would go on to make two science fiction movies, Oblivion and The Very Good Edge of Tomorrow, whether those were consolation prizes for John Carter is anyone's guess. But while other actors were in the mix, Andrew Stanton loved Taylor Kitsch and he loved his chemistry with Lynn Collins. Also considering Stanton had a trilogy in mind, he wanted actors you could see grow older in the parts, and his two picks fit that bill too. And there was the rest of the cast largely populated by British actors like Dominic West, who is most famous for his role as McNulty on the hit show The Wire on HBO, or Mark Strong as an immortal big bad. But there was room for other greats like Willem Dafoe, who worked with Stanton on Finding Nemo and loved the experience, and Samantha Morton from Minority Report. It's a great cast, mostly, and a great team of creatives. So what could possibly go wrong? John Carter of Mars, as it was known when production began, started in 2010 outside London at Long Cross Studios. The work began at the studio in an effort to lay down some of the trickier effect shots, but cinematographer Dan Mendel was always for shooting real locations where he could. 
he lobbied for four corners in Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, an actual desert, but was shot down for the first few weeks of filming. The production did ultimately move to four points, but by then, according to Mendel, a lot of damage was done to the finished product for using the older studio space. And Stanton was struggling too. He'd made animated movies for all those years, and the transition to live action wasn't as easy as he might have thought. He described the difference between animated and live action as the difference between composing a carefully orchestrated symphony and playing improvised jazz. It was a different vibe, a whole different cinematic vocabulary, and his growing pains were evident. Lynn Collins also said the London shoot was miserable, with people pulled away from their families to shoot in a drafty studio space, but then they made it to the Utah desert, and everyone had a blast. Collins also points out that this was the last time she felt like her character was being brought to the screen, but we'll get to that in a minute. Defoe was in the trickier position of wearing a motion capture suit and navigating the sand in stilts to get his performance as Tars Tarkas, but he says he enjoyed it despite the demands on him physically. Mendel loved shooting in the desert, but bristled with the precision Stan displayed in cutting the action during takes. Dan Mendel had done his early work with Jackie Chan in Rumble in the Bronx, and Chan taught him that a lot of the action happens after you call cut. But Stanton didn't leave much room for improvisation with the actors, or to let the scenes breathe. Mendel says that's why the movie may feel restrained, almost clinical. Still, he savored the chance to work on a movie that would be the cutting edge for effects with a host of talented people. Cut to a year after the shoot was done, and it was time for additional photography. Stanton had built this into the budget, knowing that the Pixar method allowed them to make their movies five to seven times before they animated anything. Live action was tougher, so he wanted the time and the money to do some extra shots and scenes as the film was assembled. But it wasn't just fine tuning. Things were changing about the texture of the film itself. Lynn Collins says this was where the character of Deja Thoris began to get lost. In the original script, she was a no-nonsense woman who made a habit of smacking John Carter when he stepped out of line. It was kind of a running gag of the movie, really. She was a warrior princess, as determined and powerful as John Carter himself. But now she was doing emotional scenes with her father, and smoothing the rough edges of her character, essentially playing the damsel in distress. She was told her character had to be more likable, and soon she was speaking with a British accent, not originally hers or in the original script, and telling Andrew Stanton to just guide her more expressly off camera because she was losing sight of what she was supposed to be doing or feeling from one moment to the next. Still, she doesn't speak ill of Andrew Stanton, who, by the way, was also busy working with Michael Chabon on hammering out the rest of the script during and after initial production, honing every beat. Again, it's that Pixar method of polish, 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 and then you shoot. Chabon said he loved the back and forth with Andrew Stanton, but it could create a dissonance with the cast and crew. Stanton later said the difference between live action and animation is that all the nerds who read the instruction books go into animation, and those who don't read instructions do live action films. Andrew Stanton was decidedly the former in a space made of talent who embraced the latter. Oh, and then came Conan. In 2011, a new adaptation of Conan the Barbarian opened, and it was a giant disappointment. It had a hot actor in Jason Momoa, a passionate fan base, and yet it tanked hard when it opened. Michael Chabon, the writer of John Carter of Mars, started to sweat a little bit. If it could happen to Conan, it could happen to John Carter. Meanwhile, Disney's old studio chief who greenlit John Carter of Mars was replaced by a guy named Rich Ross, who had come from television and had no particular affinity for John Carter, Mars, or this movie that was now in post-production. Also, talks were happening behind the scenes for Disney to acquire Star Wars from George Lucas. So, John Carter, the movie the studio didn't seem to care about all that much, was rendered even less important when this Star Wars knockoff could be replaced with actual Star Wars in just a few months. So who needed John Carter of Mars? Stanton, meanwhile, was hard at work with the visual effects houses to animate the Tharks, 
and the flying machines and a crazy fast alien dog, and that's where Stanton seemed happiest. It certainly wasn't in the effort to craft the movie's narrative, especially the opening and closing scenes with a young Edgar Rice Burroughs. Stanton wrestled with whether to cut it entirely, the right decision if you ask me, or if it was too important to provide the necessary exposition so you didn't slow down the movie halfway through to explain what the hell was going on. And then there was the title. Marketing folks were trying to figure out how to sell this movie. Andrew Stanton nixed the idea of naming it after the first book, Princess of Mars, because he believed that no boy would go see a movie called Princess of Mars, ignoring how many boys bought a book called Princess of Mars, if you ask me. So he decided on John Carter of Mars, but the marketing executives decided to drop the of Mars because of all the terrible movies with Mars in the title. Citing Mission to Mars, Mars Needs Moms, Mars Attacks, the only thing they all had in common was the name Mars and Bad Box Office. So John Carter of Mars became John Carter. And then the first trailer landed on July 14th, 2011 to almost no fanfare. The trailer doesn't mention the fact that these books basically invented science fiction fantasy and space operas, that this is the wellspring of Star Wars and Dune and Avatar. It's just a bunch of stuff that you have no reference for, much like the movie itself. Vulture ran a piece that claimed that the movie was doomed from this first trailer. And Disney was holding back on their usual media blitz. No big flood of toys in stores or big specials on the Disney Channel or ABC. No big theme park tie-ins. To paraphrase Bobcat Goldthwaite, John Carter wasn't released, it escaped. The makers of the movie were largely ignorant to the negative buzz preceding the release. Andrew Stanton, Michael Chabon, Lynn Collins, Taylor Kitsch, everyone seemed to believe that they were sitting on a hit. Only Willem Dafoe seemed to have caught wind of the fact that this might be a bad opening. The first indication for Taylor Kitsch appears to have been on the night of the premiere when he and Lynn Collins walked the press line. Collins recalls seeing Kitsch grow pale after leaning to a reporter to catch their words. When Collins caught up with him, she asked what happened. It's gonna be a fucking disaster, he told her. And it was. Not just the box office, but what the box office meant. Lynn Collins' team pulled her out of several auditions, telling her to lay low because that's how these things are done. Taylor Kitsch had to suffer the one-two punch of this and Battleship, which marred his career to this very day. Some of the effects houses had to scale back, executives were fired or stepped down, and Andrew Stanton fled back to Pixar for a Finding Nemo sequel to get his head right. And of course, the sequels that were planned, in the case of the second film largely sketched out at this point, those were shelved and John Carter fell into the public domain in 2014. But what of this film? What of John Carter? Well, to determine if this bomb is a dud or just misunderstood, let's get fantasy movie expert Chad Cooper in here for a little post-mortem on this Martian caper. Ladies and gentlemen, Tharks and Therns, it's 2012's John Carter. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, the movie that uh, dares to shave at least two words off of the title. A movie based on Edgar Rice Burroughs' extremely problematic, to say the least, book, A Princess of Mars. And it's John Carter. And I am Bo Ranstall, your host, to talk about this slam-bang science fiction fantasy extravaganza starring that dude from friday night lights and with me as ever a fan of fantasy one can argue chad cooper all right we gotta i <laughs> i want to go on record again and say that i loathe the fantasy genre of storytelling i didn't like lord of the rings all of these movies about mythical gods and serpent queens and all that bullshit i, I could barely manage getting through the harry potter movies in fact the penultimate installment of that film series was just three kids camping out for two hours. You know, Dungeons and Dragons, LARPing, the Avatar movies and the sequel that I most likely will avoid at all costs. I don't like any of it, Bo. I know you don't. And that's why this is interesting, because 
I, on the other hand, enjoy fantasy quite a bit. I like the Elric novels. I recently reread the first Elric novel, which is a terrific fantasy story. I had a regular Dungeons and Dragons game with the director of Lost After Dark for some time. Before doing this this episode, I read A Princess of Mars, uh, which isn't very long, so it's not that impressive. But I read the book that this is based on, and it's uh, a bunch of naked people running around fighting stuff and loving women and whatnot. I worked in a bookstore for a while, and I remember going past the fantasy section and just looking at all the books and being like, I can see why people burn books. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you do live in the state for it. (laughs) Well, that's how we stay warm. Florida needs a little, uh, a couple of extra degrees. Fantasy is much like its cousin sci-fi, and it's often used as a means to tell stories that are like allegories specific to the human condition. Like for for the reader, the audience, you could relate to the trials and challenges of the characters. In this movie, Bo, there's none of that. It's just a bunch of stupid made up nonsense that has no purpose. There's no real character development or conflict. It's just constantly peppering in crazy shit. It's like watching a child play with a bunch of action figures. I think sci-fi and fantasy in particular, well, and and I think most literature now that I think about, like mysteries and horror and genre fiction writ large. Erotic fiction? uh, Mm -hmm. Also erotic fiction. I think they come in two flavors, front door and back door. No, no, no. I think they there is the kind of stories you're talking about, which is like Star Trek, the original series kind of science fiction, where these are morality plays that are commenting on modern day mores and controversies in a way that makes them a little more palatable. And Star Trek The Next Generation did that too. Terrific writing, really good stuff. Then there's the pulp side of things. And that's where A Princess of Mars or John Carter of Mars, or in this case, just John Carter, that's where that falls. You know, these are pulp stories. These are swarthy men having adventures in far off places, getting the girl and beating up the bad guy. And I, you know, like it's Star still Wars, a morality play, Barton. But Star Wars is pulp. If you wanted to say there was some morality going on, there are good guys and bad guys, sure. But it's not touching on any larger kind of moral issue. It's just a pulp story. I'm not defending Star Wars. I haven't <laughs> seen all of those movies either. <laughs> oh man i wish i could say that right i'm not saying they're good i do not enjoy the genre writ large it does not connect with me mm-hmm. it's the way you feel about musicals where as soon as you get in it's like zaphod krakatos you know we must travel to the kuntan plains like just stop with all of that this, when, when people start singing and dancing and music comes out of nowhere you know how you're just like oh geez look at this that's how i feel <laughs> yeah and this whole movie is that yeah, I, I would say the difference is there are musicals I can point to and say, oh, I like that one. I, I mean, I could say the same thing. There's a handful of fantasy films that I will sit through. Enemy Mine. Um, yeah. And another one? Uh, the, the, just Enemy Mine, <laughs> which yeah, would think... be very funny. If, like the only science fiction story you relate to is a thinly veiled discussion of racism with Louis Gossett Jr. and Dennis Quaid. Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Maybe it's surprisingly violent. And surprisingly <laughs> And a man cheap. has a baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, man in the sense that it's played by Lewis Gossett Jr., but... Right. Anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about this movie. Yeah. It starts off with a traditional Disney castle logo, mm-hmm. but Bo, it's all awash in red because we're going to Mars, Bo, and Mars is the red planet, which real quick... If I haven't said it already, I hated this movie from top to bottom. And mm-hmm. it is my bottom in ranking these films. I can tell you right now. But one of the things that bothers me, the, move, the Mars isn't red. It looks like Tatooine. It's all sand and rocks. Yeah. And one of the big problems with this movie is that when you get to Mars, it is just the Utah desert, which is where it was filmed. And it's oh, really, yeah, it is one of the most boring looking movies. And it's ultimately a really boring movie, but it starts with that. Like there is nothing visually interesting about this movie. <laughs> 
I'm shocked it was filmed anywhere but a sound stage. No, this was mostly the Utah desert. It, it starts off with Willem Dafoe, who plays uh, a glee club named Tars Tarkas. We do begin with some not Morgan Freeman voiceover. Well, that's Tars Tarkas who's doing the narration. Oh, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't even care. Look, this movie doesn't connect the dots at all. This movie's like a Pollock painting. And like, like make something out of this. Yeah, it, very much so. Because like I said, if you read the original stories... I won't. It, is, it is just a swarthy dude fucking ladies fighting people he's naked 80 percent of the time like fully naked oh yeah wow yeah right if they would have made this and had him fully naked i might have been a little more interested i definitely would have been more interested cock and balls bouncing all over in 3d back in the day if they had filmed the book as it stood it would have been x-rated <laughs> and it would have been wildly entertaining Instead, they, they made this. But, yeah, so Tars Tarkas is like, hey, you, you heard about that planet Mars, did you? Well, here on Mars, we call it Barsoom. And just take all of it, and you just leave right now. <laughs> but I almost called in sick to work today, and I was going to have Gabrielle or Frank record my part of this conversation. Because I detest this movie so much. And it, Tars Tarkas says, look, this planet, it's not dead, but it's dying. Because, and this is the point where I thought, oh, Chad is going to hate all of this. Because it gets into like, oh, but there's this city that moves on a bunch of robot legs. And it's called Zodanga. You know what? How about this? How about this? What? Just set this movie in a galaxy far 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 away like nope like like a little bit further just keep going so over there just keep nope just keep, keep going i'll tell you when you get there okay run also <laughs> not only is there a moving city called zodanga there is a rival city that is the the lone holdout the good guy city named helium the city only moves once in this movie bo at the beginning oh i know it's it's a whole lot of setup for the other movies that <laughs> never ever happened because people were like zadonga how about no thank you maybe zadonga was back when they were gonna make the porno version of this john carter of zadonga Ding 3d donga. coming at you hear what i'm saying coming at you and then we we go to this moving city and it turns out that a bunch of the zadonga soldiers <laughs> are in these flying machines mm -hmm. and as tars tarkas tells us by the way just for those keep it scored at home yes we have used the words barsoom zodonga helium and tars tarkas in the first opening moments of this movie your honor i rest my case i totally agree with you that if you're watching this movie and you're getting this narration who could possibly care about this there is nothing to relate to in any of this and again i hate to compare it to the book which the book is not great but it doesn't st it starts off with john carter in the desert finding th this cave and bada bing bada boom he goes off to mars so you don't have to start off with all this opening narration it's just hey you don't know any more than john carter does and he's off on an adventure yeah the framing of this is poorly executed that would have made more sense oh wait it yeah. it's a real like i guess you're wondering how i got here anyway so it turns out that the <laughs> zadonga military and their flying machines are losing to the people of helium and tars tarkas is like and then they became cornered in a sandstorm and everything changed and so we meet our villain who i will say for the record once is named sab than but he really he is mcnulty from the show the wire yes it's dominic west yeah which when i saw him i was like what's mcnulty from the wire doing in this movie he's captaining this steampunk air pirate ship that just gets the holy hell blown out of it by its enemies this was the moment Bo, for what it's worth the first time i watched this this was the moment that i texted you and told you i hate this movie okay because i knew it was gonna happen early <laughs> and pre-credits is pretty good i guess so so like two minutes in this blue light washes over everything and uh -huh. all of a sudden the enemies of sabthan aka mcnulty from the wire and all his people just blow up 
They're just reduced to dust. Right. And then these three bald dudes in robes descend from the air like magic. Yeah, they look like Stanley Tucci cosplay experts. Yeah. Like, they're these like little outer space bald elves. And Mark Strong plays the main thern is is the name of these creatures. And not creatures, they're just dudes in robes that are bald. Uh, look, you only see them from the neck up. Take off those robes, they might be creatures. Oh, uh, it's true. Speaking of <laughs> Zadonkadonk. So Mark Strong, who you will probably know if you watch any of those uh, Sherlock Holmes movies, he was Moriarty in those movies. He's been a, a ton of stuff. Wasn't he the bad guy in Shazam? Pro uh, probably. That f that feels right. I don't All remember right. the bad guy in Shazam. How about this? You know what Stanley Tucci looks like? He looks just like that. Yeah. <laughs> Except slightly younger and a little thicker. Not nearly as handsome, though. That's Stanley Tucci, boy. <laughs> oh, you're not going to hear me badmouth the Tucci. Not on this show or any <laughs> other, quite frankly. After this big laser blasts and kills everybody, it looks like something that you would have seen come out of the hands of the Enchantress. The Enchantress. <laughs> or uh, <laughs> maybe like, like OG Zool from yeah. ghostbusters just this big blue laser that lays waste to everything and then the three bald stanley tucci elves they give this mesh wire forearm casing to mcnulty from the wire so he can kind of carry around his own blue laser beam and blow things up because he's a dick he immediately tries to shoot the stanley tucci look-alike right and they just kind of wave him away they like knock him on his ass and he's like hey the fuck is going on you just gave me this thing to shoot you with and they're like no no you're of no consequence we are in charge we are the tucci's whatever the hell they're called the thurns the tucci's is fine <laughs> the main tucci says we work for the goddess and you may as a, the, an audience member say to yourself the goddess don't worry about it doesn't happen in this movie doesn't matter <laughs> no there, there's a whole lot that don't matter it is so clear that they thought this was going to be at least three movies. That there is so much shit set up that does not pay off in the least. And uh -huh. so the main Tucci says, hey, McNulty, if you do what we ask, you will rule all of Barsoom. Which, if you were taking notes, you'll remember, is what they call Mars. And McNulty's like, hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I could do that. Wonderful. We have an accord. We shall work together. Cut to the opening credits to tell you that this movie is named, thrillingly, John Carter. <laughs> <laughs> then the movie immediately shifts to New York City, 1881. Wait, what? Uh -huh. Where are we? When are we? I was like, if Jack the Ripper shows up, I'm turning this off and I'm just going to fake my way through the rest of the room. Oh my God. If, I, on the other hand, if, if Jack the Ripper had shown up and started murdering prostitutes, now you got yourself a movie and it's a bunch of Tucci's on the case. Are you kidding me? It's better than what we're about to talk about. Oh. It's raining in New York and we see a mystery man and he's, he's walking around. Bo, it's John, it's John Carter, Bo, by the way. And he's walking in the rain and he dashes off and he's being pursued by a stranger. And so John Carter, a mystery man, he jumps in an alleyway and I think he's kind of making out with a woman. Maybe it's one of those prostitutes that's going to get killed by Jack the Ripper in a better movie that doesn't exist. And uh, kind of gives him some cover and he dashes off because he's a real scoundrel. And then John Carter, he goes over to this telegram office and he scribbles out a message. And this old geezer working there, he says, That'll be two fricks or frack with 10 words minimum, unless you want to pay extra for spatial delivery. And John Carter, he drops a silver dollar on the counter. And the old geezer says, Oh shit, this is spatial delivery. He gets so horny for this gold piece that he's handed. It's the best day of my life. <laughs> he says, Who shall I say is sending the message? And John Carter leans in and he says, Carter? John Carter? And then the movie lets us see the message on the telegram and it says, Dear Marty, if my calculations are correct, you will receive this letter immediately after you saw the DeLorean struck by lightning. Wait, wait, hold on. I gave you the wrong one. Here's your here's your telegram, young Sonny. And it actually says, Dear Ned, see me at once, John Carter. Whoa, that's me. He's quite the poet. Well, you know, he's not the writer in the family. So we cut to this character named Ned, mm. who's reading this telegram on the train. And it turns out that Ned is Edgar Rice Burroughs. What? The, the author of the book, The Princess of Mars, a.k.a. John Carter for Mars, a.k.a. John Carter, a.k.a. Who Cares? And this movie never explains why John Carter calls Edgar Rice Burroughs Ned. No. 
it is yet another dropped thread in this movie. And by the way, John Carter does not greet him at the train because, Chad, apparently he has fucking died in between that scene and Ned arriving by train because his attorney shows up and is like, yes, yes, it, I have horrible news. John Carter, your uncle? Friend? Acquaintance? Dad? brother <laughs> anyway he died it was a big surprise to everyone but how about you come to hogwarts with us where he lives right so they go to train station nine and three quarters they pop off and head over to downton abbey to keep our movie uh chugging along right. which but why is edgar rice burroughs in this movie was that part of the book oh no 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 the only time i've read a a piece of fiction where the author interjected himself or herself into the actual work was Tom Robbins. I think it was even cowgirls get the blues mm -hmm. where he is the author created a character who was taking a stance on an issue that pissed the author off so much that he actually wrote himself into his own book to argue the counterpoint against the character that he created. That's pretty good. <laughs> Stephen King did it in those Dark Tower books where he, he wrote himself as a character in those. And it doesn't work often. And it no. certainly doesn't work here. Tom Robbins pulled it off and even cowgirls get the blues. Cause he not only wrote himself into the novel as the author, he fell in love with the female protagonist and the two of them ended up together at the yeah. end of the book. <laughs> Tom Robbins is generally going to win any conversation about like, Oh, who can get away with doing this weird literary thing? Like he wrote a book entirely in second person. He's like the Frank Zappa of literature. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Tom Robbins is the best. And meanwhile, at the John Carter estate, Edgar Rice yeah. Burroughs and the attorney find this beautiful mind map on the wall of this study. Mm -hmm. And the attorney is like, I don't know what the fuck. I, I feel like he was looking for something. But anyway, we got to keep this thing moving. So do you want to go pay your respects to your dead cousin i want to say <laughs> and so they go to this crypt and yeah. the attorney is like hey he wanted this vault locked from the inside and he didn't want an autopsy and no burial or, or funeral or anything it's got no windows and no doors <laughs> the attorney is just like crazy people am i right anyway there's your dead uh college roommate i want to say did you two work together once upon a time I, I don't know. He was odd. And so he says, hey, I got a, a journal for you to read to help the movie move along. You want to go do that? <laughs> it's full of a bunch of ramblings of a crazy person. It's much like the journal that they find in the movie Seven, where it is just <laughs> the teeny tiny handwriting all about the deadly sins of the world around him or something. Yeah. But just worth pointing out, the vault where John Carter has uh, now buried or mm -hmm. you know, entombed has an inscription over it that says Intermundos or uh, Between Worlds is what that translates to. That's what that means. Huh? I didn't look that one up. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm thorough if nothing else. And so, yeah, Edgar Rice Burroughs learns that he inherits everything along with this crazy man's journal. And the attorney is like, oh, he was very explicit that you would be the only one to read it because of your closeness. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you leave me alone? I'm going to sit here and read this. And then we get some voiceover from John Carter himself as he says, hey, Ned, I'm reaching out because, you know, when you are a wide eyed boy that I don't know, did we work together at a grocery store or something? Anyway, I used to tell you all these stories and I thought maybe you might believe this shit because nobody else will. That's for sure. So this story begins in the Pinalino Mountains and the whoa, backside whoa, whoa, whoa. of hell. So our movie started off in future space or uh -huh. something. Then we flashed back to the late 1800s. Uh -huh. Now we have a flashback inside of a flashback, bro. This is like Inception, but terrible. <laughs> yeah. If, if you thought that this was going to be uh, straightforward and an easy story uh, to follow in a good like summertime popcorn movie. Oh, you were Wrong. sorely mistaken. Wait, we're going to get dream sequences and more flashbacks. Oh. There's a flash sideways. It's like being on that Willy Wonka boat. <laughs> oh, man. If only there were a chicken getting its head cut off in this movie. At least it'd be something entertaining. You see John Carter. He's on horseback, and he's approaching Fort Grand Outpost, 1868. And I was like, Fort what? When, like, I don't care. And then 
John Carter, he shows up at this bar, and the bartender says, you goddamn loon, you owe me $100. You're, you're cut off, John Carter. And then these two drunks show up, and they start a bar fight. And then John Carter, he whips out a grocery list, and he's like, I want some beans. <laughs> he throws the guy like a piece of gold. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, some Union soldiers show up, and they say, John Carter, come with us. And then Brian Cranston, a.k.a. Walter White, turns out to be the leader of these Union soldiers. Again, if you want to do a little book comparison, in the book, this guy Powell is who Brian Cranston plays, uh -huh. was just a dude that happened to be working with John Carter to hunt for this gold mine. Yeah, they don't do that here. Cranston says, John Carter. You're a hard man to find. Looks like you're a Confederate soldier who's an excellent horseman, swordsman, decorated multiple times, decorated six times, including the Southern Cross. Uh-oh. You're a born fighter. We need you to help us fight and kill Apaches. And I was like, wait a minute. John Carter was a Confederate soldier? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a character everybody can get behind. Well, a character that, you know, what, 36% of the country can get behind? Dude, the fact that they don't ever mention it again makes it it's a whole movie, Bo. way bigger of a deal you know because it's just like so you're a confederate soldier well but despite all that uh -huh. we think you're good enough to be with the union cavalry now or the american cavalry and john carter's whole gig is like i don't want to fight for anybody I just want to find a cave with a bunch of gold and get rich. I do think this is the best sequence of the whole movie, though, because he's tied to a chair and Brian Cranston is kind of giving him the business about like you were uh, decorated in the war. And then John Carter headbutts him and it cuts to Brian Cranston continuing the same speech. Uh -huh. Only now he's holding a rag over his nose. And as he's given the speech, John Carter then immediately jumps up and crashes through a window to escape. And then they bring him back. I agree. That's probably the closest thing to any humorous moment in this movie that works because all of the jokes in this film fall flat on their face. It's at least something where you're like, oh, John Carter is shown to be very good with escaping and he's a good fighter and all that stuff. And, and it's kind of a funny gag. But then eventually they just throw him in jail and he's like, I want no part of your war or whatever. This whole human species is a bunch of assholes. I don't want to have anything to do with anybody. I'm going to break out of this cell. I'm going to get rich. And then I'm going to buy your blue behind Brian Cranston so I can just kick it all day long he also says i paid my dues in full and then he taps his hand up on the metal bars and we see that he's wearing two wedding bands leading the audience to believe that maybe his wife or possibly his husband was killed mm -hmm. and he wears them both as a reminder of his dead true love but let's be clear it was his wife and his daughter also got killed yeah and if you have any illusions about that as soon as they leave him alone in the cell he goes to sleep and has a very brief dream of his now dead wife saying john Cotta, supper's ready and then he wakes up oh what it's like pulp fiction Bo, but without all the things that make a good movie in it to get out of this jail cell he pisses on the floor and the guard comes over he's like hey i thought i gave you a bucket and as soon as the guard comes close enough john carter grabs him knocks him out by yanking him into the bars and so john carter then steals brian cranston's horse and escapes from fort what you would call it but all of the Union soldiers immediately give chase, and they're right behind him. Mm -hmm. And then they come up to an embankment. They go over the top, and then there's a bunch of Apache there. John Carter is able to speak their native language. They chit-chat for a minute, and you think this scene's going to go somewhere. And then one of the soldiers just shoots one of the Apache, and it turns into a like a firefight. And Cranston gets shot. Like, really shot. Because John Carter is our hero, he grabs Brian Cranston, throws him over the back of his horse to get him out of there. And yeah. these Apaches chase them all the way to this cave where they take shelter. And wouldn't you know it, Chad, the Apaches won't enter this cave. And it turns out that there is a marking that looks kind of like a spider that is indicative of the fact that this is the cave that John Carter has been looking for the whole time. Because he's like, what? A spider? Do you think a spider was going to show up? 
I hoped, you know, that it was going to be like Wild Wild West, which even though that movie is terrible and among the most racist things we've ever seen, it's still better than this. Kingdom of the Spiders is better than this. And I can't say oh. that about many, many movies. Kingdom of the Spiders is way better than this. That uh, stuff it is. actually happens in that movie. They go into this cave and John Carter, he's kind of like walking around and there's etchings on the wall. And the, he looks up and he sees these notable deposits of gold there's lots of it yeah and just as things are starting to turn around one of those intergalactic stanley tucci weirdos from the future gets beamed down into the movie from i guess that earlier part where we started the movie oh and then this future weirdo he attacks john carter they tussle for a bit john carter shoots the stanley tucci lookalike in the head brian cranston's just laying at the opening of this cave screaming Mostly because he got shot in the stomach and he's just bleeding out, I'm guessing. I can't believe they shot me, Stanley Tucci. Cranston was in season three of Breaking Bad at this point. What's he doing in this movie? John Carter cradles him and is like, hey, you're going to be okay. Say the fucking words. John Carter walks over to the dying, bald Space Tucci. And the Space Tucci is like muttering some incantation words like mecha lecha hai, mecha hai ho. And then John Carter picks up this amulet medallion that glows blue. The Tucci's dying words are basoom. And then John Carter goes barsoom. And then zoom, he's magically transported to the red planet, which is not red at all. It's, you know, white and yellow and brown. Yeah. So, sure enough, that's how he gets to Mars. But he's not really on Mars, right? Like we, we're going to talk about this later. He's not really on Mars. Well, like, his body is on Earth, but it's a copy of him that's on Mars? It's a real existential problem. It's like somewhere in time. That's a time travel movie I got issues with. We'll leave that one on the shelf for a while. But <laughs> this is, like, you looked at a penny, and that fucked everything up? This doesn't make any sense. Anyway. So he sees this reflection off in the distance and he's like, oh, maybe I can get home from there. And he starts to walk towards it and is waylaid by the fact that he now can fly off as he's trying to take a step like the low gravity of Mars prevents him from walking like a normal person. He's like Milo in Mars Needs Moms. I got superpowers. Oh, John Carter sucks. <laughs> He, but he does. He has these natural superpowers where he can leap in the air like old school Superman. Yeah. And we get this playful moment where he kind of learns about his new superpowers. And then he picks up a rock and throws it super far. I'm like, so he can kind of sort of fly and he's super strong too. Mm -hmm. Which isn't bad. Like now we got something. By the way, he drops this medallion like a dumb dumb. Sure. And he starts hearing something coming from this mound of rocks and he finds basically it's a dome with a bunch of alien eggs in it. And if my movies have taught me anything chad this guy's about to become the breeding ground for a xenomorph he looks down below through this clear crystal kind of looks like glass and down are all these eggs that start hatching open and they look like muppet baby versions of the gamorian guards yeah they're little frog babies they're disgusting <laughs> We cut to this bony alien hand picking up the amulet that John Carter just dropped on the ground. How this guy found it out in the middle of everywhere, I don't know. <laughs> well, because we need a MacGuffin for this movie. <laughs> John Carter looks up from watching these green horned slime balls come to life. And then off in the distance, there's a group of, I don't know, like Martians? The Varsumians? Is what they're called. They're riding on these CGI beasts. And that guy who found the amulet, his name, Tars Tarkas. Uh, Tars Tukas. He shows up. And these aliens, they're like, what, 15, 18 feet tall? They have tusks that come out of their cheeks and they're green. Which, Bo, is the skin color of choice of most movie aliens. Yeah. Green or brown? Those are your two most popular. Yeah, these are actually, in the grand scheme of things, the way that Princess of Mars describes the Thark, this is pretty close. I mean, physically, although the nature of their society and so forth is very different. But yeah, so John Carter sees these bony aliens with tusks coming, and he has no weapon. Tars Tukas 
is like, hey, everybody, don't shoot this guy. I, I kind of want to see what he'll do or whatever. But he speaks in his native language. So you don't really understand any of that till a little bit later. They're going to use some of that Mars Needs Moms trickery to get it to where we don't have to deal with two different languages. Hold on. For that. Which leads to a scene where Willem Dafoe, who is playing Tars Tilkus, is like, Tars Tarkus. And John Carter is like, oh, I'm Captain John Carter from Virginia. And so Tars Tarkas is like, Virginia? And he's like, no, I'm from Virginia. And it's like, dude, stop saying Virginia and they'll get it right. It's a real comedy of errors, Bo. Well, it's errors. I don't know how comic it is. <laughs> Tars Tarkas says, you jump. And he's like doing a little bony finger. Also, Tars Tarkas has double the number of arms, which in this movie, that's how they created all the creatures. Like whatever you started with, double its appendages. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's baseline. Right. Everything has, like the horse creatures have eight legs and the white gorillas have six legs. Like just double it. They have two penises. Five assholes. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow uh, and no heart oh so john carter is like oh you want me to jump what Saduka virginia listen up spider-man i mean virginia <laughs> so he does he jumps over oh. tars tarkas and grabs his gun and tars tarkas tries to tell his people hey don't kill this dumb dumb but they fire anyway, and so John Carter gets shot in the ass. Like with a tranquilizer dart. <laughs> they rub some salve on his ass. Uh, that's why they call him Tars Tukas. <laughs> He's got the ass salve. I have to sit a lot in my job, and it gives me the hemorrhoids real bad. So that's why they call me Tars Tukas. Also, they round up all these little Muppet baby demons, and I think they're going to be their food. I think they eat them. That's the story I told myself. Mm -hmm. And Tars Tarkas, he says, kill the rest. Leave nothing for the white apes, which I was like, whoa, 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 white apes. Like, are we dealing with space racism or speciesism? Oh, yeah. And I was like, do apes exist in this world? Is that a derogatory term? Or is that just what he calls them? I don't know. You never see them in this movie, although they feature pretty prominently into... Um, aren't the, the, aren't the white apes the things in the Thunderdome pit? No, 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 no. They make a point because John Carter is like, hey, are those white apes? Well, they look like white apes. Yeah, but he's the one who's like, no, no, no. Those are the BAMP. Jesus Christ. Yeah. The thing that's a giant white ape isn't the white ape? I don't think so. It doesn't matter. I believe you read the source material. I thought about burning it in a store. They kill all the babies who don't hatch because they're weak. Which is actually a thing for the book because they're a very warlike species and don't have any camaraderie with one another. Like their entire civilization is based on sort of cruelty and war. Mm. Except in this, they're all kind of friendly, which is not how things work out in the story. Anyway. I like how all of the aliens look the exact same, and they don't really have any distinguishing features or clothing that helps you determine who is who. There's one guy who's got a busted tusk. He was easy. And then there's the one that's all scarred up, but everybody else looks the same. The one with the broken tusk is Tall Taljus, uh -huh. who is uh, Thomas Jane. No, not Thomas Jane. What, we uh, got Green Goblin and yeah. Sandman in the same movie. And a guy who bounces around like Spider-Man. <laughs> right. I'll get you, Spider-Man. Wasn't that the most recent Spider-Man movie? No Way Home? Uh-huh. But he didn't go to Mars. Oh, no, 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 he didn't. All right, all right, let's keep going. Here we go. All right, so then we go to our other main character, who is Deja Thoris. Mm -hmm. Princess Deja. Who is the, the princess of Mars. Yeah. And she is practicing a speech about renewable energy. Spoilers, that does not appear in the book. She also has a British accent. Yeah, all the villains do. It's very Star Wars. Uh, and, and so, or or like Princess Leia in that one scene in Star Wars before they told her to knock it off. <laughs> or she started drinking and forgot. A little bit of the coke <laughs> nail. <laughs> one of my favorite things about Empire Strikes Back is that you can see Carrie Fisher's cocaine fingernail in many of the scenes. It's really wonderful. <laughs> Her father, who is a guy named Tardos, comes in <laughs> and... 
so stupid. She starts her speech about this renewable blue energy that she's found, and he's like, you know what? This is going to have to wait. We got a, a little bit of a problem, and everybody seems very excited. Yeah, they all talk over each other as they walk in. It's a real, like, harumph, 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 harumph. That's what I said. Whatever you say, PJ. We've got problems. How are we going to do with all of this moving city? Harumph, harumph, helium. It turns out that there has been a defeat suffered by the forces of helium and McNulty from The Wire in a scene that sounds pretty interesting, which is why we don't see it in this movie. Right. Has cornered their forces and set terms of surrender which is i will stop blowing the shit out of all of you if you give me your daughter's hand in marriage what father how dare you how dare you i will not marry that horrible horrible man he's horrible father tardos her dad is like well then what are we gonna do you better come up with a better plan i'm not marrying that horrible horrible man and she's like wait i've got a wonderful idea i've been working on this special blue light here let me show you everybody come hey gather around she wants to show us her science project all right sweetheart what do you got come on daddy's little girl i know you've been working hard show me what you got here little baby girl so it's the blue light that we saw from the space two cheese earlier except she has somehow tapped into this but before it can truly form it explodes yeah a saboteur comes over and lays his hands on it and gives it a little zippity zap and it pops off her dad is like all right everybody out i gotta talk to my no father no look i can make it this machine it produces the ninth ray it has unlimited power i can replicate it yeah i'm sure you can baby girl i'm sure you can (laughs) look we got a wedding to plan all right and uh you're gonna be the star yeah and he says this is the will of the goddess you know the goddess it's her will father that's bullshit mcnulty from the wire he's a monster all right i won't marry him i can't marry him i shan't marry him all right all right yeah i'll tell you what why don't you sit here and think about it a little bit i'm gonna go call the cater and the florist and do you want uh, a band or do you want a dj dj's a little cheaper i want no part of any of this i will not marry mcnulty from the wire okay father we'll make it a dj so i'm not doing the chicken dance yep we'll see they all say that and after they get a few in them they're out there clucking around well it's gonna be a hell of a wedding boys open bar on me all right and then helium basum tacarac whatever we're gonna do we're getting together it's gonna be a hell of a wedding and somebody kind of peeks in is like hey king tardos or whatever yeah 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 what's up Hey, uh, McNulty from The Wire, his ship just showed oh, up. He, hey, tell him to call me dad. I like that. I like when the son-in-law calls the father of the bride dad. Tell him to do that. All right. So I should tell him to, that it's cool if he lands? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, go get some of my good stuff. It's on the top shelf in the very back. Oh, I watered some of that down, father. <laughs> when you went out of town, me and my girlfriend stayed up all night watching Friday the 13th movies. I know you did, sweetheart. I know you did. All right. That's okay. It's all right. I'm going to hand you off to this other guy. You're going to be his problem now. Outside the door, though, one of the space Tucci's like shapeshifts back into his Tucci form right. from being a guard or whatever. Why would you do that? Just stay the form right. you look anyway. It's so dumb. And he calls the main space Tucci, whose name is Matai. <laughs> All right. And he's like, hey, other Stanley Tucci, I destroyed the device before Deja Thoris could discover the source of our energy. And they cut to the main space Tucci, who is hanging out with McNulty from The Wire. And he says, all right, you keep an eye on her because the wedding is being arranged. We can't let anything go wrong because of our insidious plan. John Carter gets brought to the village of these 15 foot tall forearm green aliens. And they live in the rocks of a cave or something. And they drop off all those little babies that are going to get et up probably <laughs> in the next few weeks mm-hmm. by these long-legged freaks. And then Tars Tarkas, he barks out some words in Alienese. And we later find out that this character named Sola, who is his daughter, she walks over and she cuts the bindings off of John Carter's wrist and ankles. And she's the one who's covered in all of these branding marks. And John Carter says, what happened to you? You're all scarred up. Yeah, and she's like, and he's like what? And so he sees this medallion on Tars Tukas's belt. Hey, that's my amulet! And so he makes a jump for it. And- <laughs> 
And then the Sandman alien puts a sword to John Carter's throat. And as he's watching, Tars Tuchus and this guy are fighting over, like, who has authority in this alien civilization. Yeah, it's kind of a dick measuring contest. And so the Sandman alien is like, who will pledge their medal to me? And nobody in the crowd says shit, which is real embarrassing. <laughs> <coughs> and so Tars Tuchus says, you may rule. But not today, Spider-Man. <laughs> and the Sandman alien is like, you're right, not today. And so Tars Tuchus then tells everyone, this is Virginia. He can jump really high and throw rocks really far. He'll save us all. From what or who? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Maybe he thinks of it as a bet. I'm, I'm going to make a fortune on this guy. It's basically the <laughs> Digstown scam. Hello, my honey. Hello, my baby. Hello, my ragtime cow. Like, Virginia, jump! Ribbit. I will have him jump farther than any 10 men in this county. <laughs> and then Bruce Dern shows up and says, All right, he'll jump farther than any 10 men in this county today. <laughs> Like, uh, Mickey Mouse. He asked John Carter to jump, and John Carter's like, no. And so he basically tells Sola to chain up John Carter and take him to a Joe versus the volcano scene mm -hmm. where John Carter is. him up and shave him. Yeah. Like throw powder on him along with all the baby reptile aliens and whatnot. You said a Joe versus the volcano scene. I was thinking it was like when uh, Tim Robbins went to Shawshank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a little of both. I think of both of those movies as being essentially the same film. Sola goes over and she pours some liquid into John Carter's mouth that magically removes the subtitles from our movie because now John Carter can understand all of the alien languages. Dude, he trips balls on this stuff. And then when he wakes up, he's like, oh, I can understand everyone? What? He's chained to this wall. And the movie introduces another character in the form of this fat space dog. He looks like a 10 foot long four foot tall slobbering chicken mcnugget uh-huh and also this space dog runs faster than the flash why does this dog run so fast it doesn't matter it doesn't come into play at all in this movie not really but there are a lot of nerds online that are like what if this space dog and superman had a race who would be faster so john carter escapes from his frog dog and jumps into a tower where a bunch of these Tharks are all throwing a party. Yeah, and the space dog runs inside the party, and they all just start kicking the shit out of this space dog. Yeah, so John Carter steps in and punches a dude and kills, he kills him. kills him! Yeah, with a single punch, he murders this dude. Is that justifiable homicide? Oh, for sure. <laughs> I hurt a dog? Yeah. <laughs> and so Tars Tuchus is like... Who's to blame for this, Spider-Man? And somebody is like, oh, it's your daughter, Wink Wink Sola, who is supposed to be keeping an eye on this weird little dude and didn't. And so a bunch of the Thark soldiers knock out John Carter. They just beat the shit out of him, jump on top of him. It's been a while, though, so the movie throws in a flashback. Right. To John Carter and his wife and his daughter. But then we immediately stop that scene because we don't need that no more. It was just a little taste of the past. Yeah. John Carter and this alien lady, Sola, are tied to this big stone pillar. And Sola is Tars Tarkas's daughter. Yeah. We're going to find that out a little later, but if you're scoring at home, they're related. Yeah, and so she's given another brand, and Tars Tuchus tells her, there's no more room left for another mark. The next time, we're gonna fucking kill you. Tars Tarkas then, once again, goes over to John Carter, and he says, okay, Virginia, jump! And before we repeat this scene for like the third or fourth time where he wants to see him jump around, McNulty from The Wire and his flying machines, they're on their way. And then an action sequence is imminent, Bo. And McNulty from The Wire, he's flying in and he says, I'm going to kill everybody and destroy everything with my blue laser chicken wire glove. And then the main Stanley Tucci, he leans in and he says, no, no, don't do that. Don't kill everybody. You need to keep Princess Deja alive. Remember, you're going to marry her. By the way, lest we forget to point this out, the space Tucci is invisible to everyone else. Oh, he's kind of like that monkey from uh, Cutthroat Island. Oh, I thought you were going to say monkey bone. But yes, also <laughs> from Cutthroat Island. <laughs> yeah, so McNulty 
follows that advice is like, yeah, just knock out the engines or whatever. And down below, Tars Tukas and his people are just like getting out the popcorn. Are like, yeah, yeah let these two fuck each other up. This will be a good time. Ilium and Zadonga, they're going to crack each other's skulls open. This is going to be great. You know, they're going to kill each other until only Fox remain. Fox, 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 yeah. We're going to make Maz Fox again. The space racism is real in this movie, and I'm the one who's pushing it all. John Carter, seeing that not knowing there's a princess involved but seeing that you know there's a bunch of big ships against a little one says well that doesn't seem very fair and so on board the princess's spaceship she is trying to escape and and decides like oh well i'm about to die so i'm just gonna ram one of the other zadonka ships mm, it's, it's the zadonka donk uh-huh sure enough it starts to explode she's about to fall to her death and then john carter is like whoa is that a lady She's a human and she's pretty. I'm going to save her. So he does. He jumps and catches her <laughs> in midair as she falls. <laughs> yeah. Sprawling. <laughs> Oh, and he also has a chain strapped to his arm like Kratos from God of War. Or maybe Ghost Rider. John Carter, a Confederate soldier bow, mm -hmm. grabs this woman. They land, and then he p grabs a sword and just starts swashbuckling bad guys. Well, he doesn't know who's a good guy or bad guy. I'm talking about the swashbuckling. Was that something that a Confederate soldier would know how to do? You know, if they had served a little time with the Pirates of the Caribbean, sure. All right. And then Princess Deja, uh -huh. she gets in there. She can fend for herself. And they beat off like hundreds of people, right? Oh, yeah. It's just wanton murder left and right. He ends up on one of these flying machines, somehow knows how to operate this battle cannon and he just starts shooting spaceships out of the sky then mcnulty from the wire he comes down on this ship and he and john carter start swashbuckling the green aliens start shooting the airships with their primitive weapons and somehow they blow a few out of the sky that's pretty good mm -hmm. princess shows up and she explains more about the conflict between these two cities and john carter kind of mouths off he's like oh, i don't fight for anyone well, and also the Space Tucci's tell McNulty, hey, listen, McNulty, we want to keep this one alive. There is something different about this man. And McNulty is real pissed off because he was about to, you know, zap John Carter with his murder hand. Uh-huh. And he's real pissed off. He's like, you guys won't let me kill anybody. I want to kill the princess. You stopped me there. I was going to kill this uh, little grasshopper of a dude. You won't let me kill him. Who am I going to get to kill with this thing? Why'd you even give this to me? <laughs> John Carter, after saying he doesn't fight for anyone, Tars Tarkas comes over and he says, Hey, Virginia, if you don't fight for us, I can't confirm the safety of your pretty girlfriend over here. So John Carter says, All right, I'll fight for you. Yeah, they give him a new name because John Carter is the most boring name that a hero can have. So they call him Dotar Sojat, which means the right hands of the whatever. These aliens start burning the bodies of all the people who crashed to the ground in their spaceships and it had to stink right like just the smell of burning flesh and hair i think that is supposed to actually smell kind of tasty the princess wants to know how john carter can jump so high and i'm with her and it's explained to john carter that he's on mars or barsoom and then john carter tells the princess that he magically transported there with an amulet is that what happened i i really got confused by all of this and farida she's like uh all right sure you sound like you're a crazy person but you do have this hopping power that I find very valuable. So how about you come back with me to Helium, mm -hmm. Land of Balloons. And high squeaky voices. Yeah, and teach all of our people how you do that jumping thing. Well, I bit my knees and then I straighten out my legs. Yes, but there has to be something more than just regular jumping. How do you do the special jumping? Well, first I bend my knees, and then I straighten my legs out real fast. And that's how I do it. And then the way I throw rocks really far is I pick up a rock, and I just whip my arm like this, and then I let my fingers go, and then the rock just goes to the sky. That's how I do it. How about I give you, hmm, a hundred Mars dollars to tell us how you do the jump thing? 
Okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. What? I'm on Mars? Yes, I just told you that. What? I don't know what a Mars is. Yeah. So he tells her ultimately, like, I'm no mercenary. And, you know, on my planet, the ships don't sail in the air like here. They sail on endless waters. And she's like, what? You're crazy. John Carter or Dota Sojet or whatever you call yourself. There are no seas on this planet. Is she in disbelief because ships sail on water because there are boats in water here in just a few scenes yeah i know it's stupid right like because she's genuine it would be like again the idea of like oh we have ships that sail on the air and you're like i can't fathom how this works and she's just ships on water how can that be and then they're in a freaking canoe yeah in three minutes yeah that's all right so anyway later that night they're drawing in the dirt which is i assume john carter's primary form of communication <laughs> their equivalent of television yeah and he's like look i'm from here this planet and she's like why that is not earth or whatever weird word you called it that is jasum you are on basum and he's like, oh, no, that's Mars. What? I'm on Mars? And she's like, hmm, I think you're a liar or crazy. Whatever. Either way, you're kind of a big chunk of man. And he basically says, look, you know, I don't know how I got here, but there was a medallion. And she says, oh, so you're a thern? And he's like, uh, yeah, I'm a thern. I just want to get back to my home. Jasum. I hate this movie. She agrees to take him to this temple. Is that right? And so it's it's Sola, the space dog, John Carter, and Princess Deja. And they're all going to go to down a river something something to find a something. The gates of Is to go to the goddess Isis. Before they, they get out of there, there's the whole deal where they get caught in this temple. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And... Uh, they're like, oh my God, Sola let, you know, John Carter and this other woman Quit in this going, temple. Sola. Now you're going to get killed. Right. you got no more room for tattoos and brandings. And so Tars took us, goes into a tent where John Carter and Sola are hanging out. And he's like, look, I'm going to let you guys go, but you got to take Sola with you because she's my daughter, see? And so that's how they end up escaping from this whole Thark city. What do you say? Hook us, took us. We're out of here. And then they bounce. <laughs> but the Sandman alien realizes that Tars took us, has let them go. And so he says, Oh, Tars took us, has betrayed all of the Thark. John Carter looks like he's on his way to a men's only BDSM club in South beach. He's got these leather straps crisscross his chest. His nipples are sticking out. You know, I prefer it in the book when he's naked all the time. <laughs> I wish. I would have enjoyed it so much more. Oh, sure. All that sword play. Like, whoo! It would be like the Northmen, which, spoilers, the Northmen <laughs> ends with two dudes naked fighting each other, and it rocks. At a, in a volcano, no less. It fucking rules. <laughs> it turns out that they're on their way to this location, but the princess has lied to him, Bo, and she's taking John Carter and Sola and that dog to Helium and not the river of isis or isis or whatever uh -huh. so john carter he confronts the princess and he says hey we're we're going the wrong way and the princess says i cannot marry mcnulty from the Y. I cannot do it i cannot do it and so he says all right princess we're kicking you off of our bantha beasts and we were just you're gonna leave you here and this is the point where sola is like should we go back for her and he's like just give it a minute Ugh, she'll come around i know dames if i know anything it's broads but and sure enough she's like all right i'll take you to the gates of is and sola is like oh i think that girl's a princess john carter and he's like what oh, what that's pretty oh she's probably got gold and john carter like the whole deal with him is you know he's a pacifist at this point no good is gonna come of me fighting her war and princess deja is like well that may be true but there are no gates of is so put that in your pipe and smoke it john carter and carter says well my medallion was real and so was my cave of gold where did you get that where did mcnulty from the y give you that as a wedding present i will not marry him i will not i won't 
I shan't. I can't. I don't. I won't. I haven't. I will not marry him in a box. I will not marry him with a box. I will not marry him here or there. I will not marry McNulty from the wire anywhere. So cut to the space Tucci who is telling McNulty, like, you need to go after this princess. And he has a psychic conversation with the other Tucci's about Tucci, the- Tucci, Tucci, come in Tucci's. <laughs> Tucci number one to Tucci number two. Over. <laughs> Come in, Tucci number two. Tucci number two here. Over. Tango, tango, Tucci. <laughs> I'm eastbound and down. 18 wheels are rolling. Ten full, good buddy. John Cotter and his crew are going to be at the river is soon. Tango, tango. One moment, please. There's a child sticking his arm out the, the window of his car. <laughs> Look how happy I made that boy. Space Tucci number one says, don't worry, I'm already at the river. And it's just magically there. Uh huh. And so you're like, well, I'm halfway through this movie and I don't understand the rules of any of this. These are just magic people that can do whatever they want whenever they want. I don't even know if they're bad guys. I still don't know. You find that out in John Carter too, which no, uh, I don't. will never ever happen. So our heroes make it to the banks of the river is. Mm -hmm. They paddle down the river. They leave Space Dog behind. And immediately they find the gates of Is, And it looks like the Millennium Falcon carved out of rock. Yes. John Carter grabs Princess Deja and hops up to the top of this thing. He's got magic feet, Bo. Lieutenant Dan, you've got magic <laughs> legs. He steps on these rocks and blue sparks start popping off. And then the gates of the Is Temple open up. Like, yeah. Why does John Carter have the ability to do this? I don't know. This wasn't in the book. It just keep going. It is maddening in this movie how much stuff happens that is not explained and just glossed over. It's right. utter nonsense. So inside princess deja is like these aren't the work of gods at all these are just machines give me your medallion and i will not marry mcnulty i will not i won't marry him i won't marry him i won't give me your medallion and then she puts it on the ground and it lights up all blue and she says my isis my chrysis the ninth ray is real such powers being used by zodega zundoga and the third must be real and you are john carter from earth and truly there are ships that sail on seas i can't imagine something like that even though that's how we got here <laughs> And this is a map of the solar system. Solar system. It shows Basum and Jasum and Kasum and Fasum and Dasum. So the whole deal is that this is just a big intergalactic teleporter. Mm -hmm. But this is the point where John Carter realizes like, wait a second. Are you saying that I'm just a copy of myself? what i didn't say that at all in fact no one said that why did those words come out of your mouth and i'm not getting married look i need a bunch of science stuff to figure all of this out and all that science stuff is in helium at the hall of science stuff well that sounds like a pretty good place to keep all your science stuff in the hall of science <laughs> princess deja says i don't think you just want your cave of gold after all john carter you need a cause and there's one here on basum and so they make out a little bit but as yeah. soon as he kisses her like he has a flashback to his wife and kid again and he just punches yeah. her in the face like get away from me and she's like oh you know that's better than getting married to mcnulty from the wire he's a bit of a drinker and he's always on a stakeout somewhere outside some real nasty looking aliens show up they look like the green ones from earlier just kind of from the wrong side of the tracks and they start throwing spears at sola so our crew escapes and they head off and the head stanley to she tells these other mean green aliens to capture the woman in red alive she is a princess which we haven't talked about what the princess and her species of people look like they're all covered in these red henna tattoos yeah except for the princess hers only goes up to her neck she doesn't have the the full mike tyson face uh, adornments yeah, but it's an entire race of people who spend a little bit too much time out in the sun. It's very silly. Although she's dressed not completely dissimilarly from Princess Jasmine. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, this horde of aliens, they start chasing after our heroes and they're riding like the equivalent of alien horses and are chasing our three misfits and space dogs there. And uh, during this action-packed sequence, Bo, the movie decides to give us a flashback to John Carter coming into his burned down shack to find the charred corpses of his wife and daughter who killed them Bo? i don't know don't yeah. matter i assume the same people who killed josie wales's uh family a candle fell over and they were asleep 
Yeah, he's he's got a burning rage against wax makers the universe <laughs> over. This whole action sequence of John Carter just slaughtering these aliens like they're made out of wet tissue paper is intercut with a scene of John Carter digging graves and burying the charred remains of his wife and daughter back on the farm. Yeah, this would be be more effective if you knew how long ago did the death of his wife and daughter happen what was the cause of it who is he really angry at is it why would they explain it? that they're not explaining anything else <laughs> you're right you're right a spaceship shows up and starts blasting all of the wrong side of the track aliens turns out it's the princess's dad baby girl it's me your dad we got a wedding going on you know what we have even taken in to get fitted for your wedding dress. You know you're wearing the slut wedding dress that McNulty from The Wire, his mother wore it. And va va voom, you should have seen her with the hoo and the ha, huh, and you're gonna look like an angel, all right? I'm gonna walk you down the aisle and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cry. All right, I'm gonna cry. All right, I'm gonna cry because my baby girl's getting married, all right? To McNulty from the wire in the West. Did you ever see the wire? Oh my gosh, it's at the precedent for the new age of golden television. So, Chad. John Carter is just under a heap of corpses uh -huh. that they pull off of him, discover that he's still alive, although injured. He's all tuckered. He slaughtered about 800 aliens. McNulty is just like, you know what? We'll take him with us. Come on, throw him on the boat. We'll make sure that he's okay. Princess Deja, I was just really worried that you were going to get hurt out here. Wait a minute. Your fingers are crossed. No, 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 no. Uh, here, let me say it again. I was really, really concerned that you were going to get hurt, and that's the last thing in the world that I want. You closed your eyes during half that sentence. That's a tell. You're a liar. I will not marry you, McNulty. From the why, I will not marry you. And her father is like, listen, baby girl, I got to tell you, from the time that you went missing, this guy was out of his gourd. All he wanted to do was find you and get married. So I think he's all right. I, uh, give the guy a chance. Why don't you? Really, father? He was concerned about me. Oh, well, that's more than John Carter's ever been. Let me ask you a question. How high can McNulty from the wire jump? I, you know, he's uh, two, three feet, maybe. I don't know. We, we, it hasn't mm. come up yet. We Mostly we were just playing some poker, having some cigars, and uh, I gave him some of the good stuff from the top shelf. Father, I'm not saying yes, but I'm not saying no. Hey, it's a oh. start. Hey, well, you got anything you want to say there, McNulty? And so McNulty from The Wire says, yes, I have something to say. And he hands the princess his sword and says, listen, anything is possible if our two cities unite. All you have to do is marry me and I will offer you in exchange my life. So you can do with me what you will. Hmm, so my options here, marry you, which I don't want to do, mostly, or cut off your head. Hmm. Listen, baby girl, let me just say, you get married to this guy, we're gonna be sitting pretty in helium. He does have a lot of flying machines. I do like to fly. You know, and all the people in Zabadu or wherever the hell he's from, three penises. Dear, three? Mm-hmm, he showed me. I got to hold one of them. That's almost as many holes as I have. Hmm. I'm not saying no, but I'm leaning more towards yes. I might marry McNulty from the wire. Yeah, so they just throw John Carter on the ship and take off. Meanwhile, Sola and the frog dog, like, come out of the sand after everybody leaves. Well, that's what the supervisor did back in Mars Needs Mom. She hit him on the sand. That's what you do on Mars. Apparently so. Back-to-back -back Mars movies with all striking similarities <laughs> in a lot of ways in that neither of them are entertaining. From the same studio. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Boy, you, Disney will never again make a movie set on Mars. They're like, well, look, we've been burned twice. Never again. <laughs> but yeah, so John Carter wakes up in a bedroom and there's a bunch of guards around and he learns that he is in Zadonga Dinga Dong. Mm -hmm. And one of the princess's guards comes in and he's like, psst. John Carter, take me oh. hostage. Wait, who? You've been taken hostage? No, no, no. You take me hostage. It's part Are of you a coming plan. coming on to me? No, no. Well, I mean, not 
no, but not now. The guard grabs his own sword, puts it against his own throat, grabs John Carter's hand, holds it up against the sword. And he's like, help, John Carter has taken me hostage. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. What? Yes, you did. Yeah, it, it totally happens like that. And so this guy gets him outside and he says, listen, I was talking to the princess. You remember her, don't you? Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. She says, you can jump us from here to that big tower way over there. Oh, man, I'm going to have to really bend my knees and straighten them out real fast to make that big jump. And then he does. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that that exciting sequence happens. And they end up in Princess Deja's bedroom. Uh-huh. Princess Deja is like, everybody, get out of here. I need to talk to this man alone. You sure look pretty, princess. Are you getting married or something today? No. Well, maybe. I don't know. Do you have something to say about this? I don't know. I was married one time, but then my wife and daughter burned up alive. Well, you know, if there were a ban who maybe wanted to fight for helium, I might be persuaded to call off this wedding. I'll keep my eyes and ears open for you, princess. Well, I mean, a man maybe in this room. Like the guard in the corner? No. That, that, uh, look, I figured out this whole medallion thing. All you have to do is hold the medallion and say, make a lecker high, make a high ho. Ah, and then that'll send me back home, huh? Uh-huh. Let's try it right now. And then he says, mecha like a high, mecha hiney, but he doesn't say the ho. And then the princess turns around as some people come in through the front door. And when she turns around, John Carter is gone. He's disappeared. And she's like, oh, he's zip zap back to Jarsum or Earth or whatever. But it turns out, though, he's just boinged up into the rafters of the room. So he sneaks out and is hit by this lady who was in the room looking all suspicious. And it turns out it's the main space Tucci yeah. in disguise. Just shake nothing. So so the Tucci uses this blue lightning stuff to paralyze him and they go yeah. to his space limo. I called it a space paddy wagon, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's one and the same. And he basically lays out his evil plan, which is, oh, we are going to conquer this world. Well, we just basically hang out and let the world conquer itself. We've done this on many worlds. We shapeshift. We find idiots like McNulty from The Wire and we help them destroy other people then we move to another planet and repeat it over and over again it's a hobby this happens all the time societies rise they divide and then there's war and the planet dies in the process as all these warring nations neglect one another so that's what's happening here and then we might move on to earth later you know i've always meant to spend a little more time in virginia that's where you're from right because i understand your accent because you know i'm a thern and all we're smarter than you we're bolder than you we're better than you john carter from earth earth what a sad little planet you ride horses that only have four legs unlike here on Barsoom, where they have eight you know how cool Stanley Tucci is? Very right. We're infinitely cooler than that because we are from space. <laughs> We are shockingly close to the end of this movie. Thank goodness. What the Space Tucci is not aware of, though, is that the Space Dog is on the hunt for John Carter. <laughs> if you say so. Oh, that's right. Space Dog does show up and save John Carter because he bites a Space Tucci on his arm. Uh -huh. And then that breaks the spell. Uh -huh. Like when Short Round burned Indiana Jones like whoa, whoa snaps him out of it the space dog tackles space Tucci and John Carter kind of snaps out of the spell grabs this medallion and then Space Tucci shapeshifts into McNulty and tells all the guards like, hey, that's the John Carter that we're trying to kill. Get him. <clears throat> and so John Carter grabs one of the dragonfly flying machines. A Confederate soldier. Yeah. Who has never been in any sort of flying machine. He just takes to the skies, Bo, yep. with hilarious results filled with action and adventure. Yeah. Why wouldn't he just jump his way out of the situation rather than fly off on this machine? It's a fine question, Chad, but we're not going to get the answer to that and many other questions, quite frankly. <laughs> so he just flies out to the desert where he crashes and Space Dog and Sola find him. Uh-huh. And he tells them, I'm going to save Deja, the princess, and I'm going to need an army to do it. So Sola, get on this flying thing. And she, she says, well, Tharks don't fly. And What? Uh, yeah. Cut to them crashing into the outskirts of the Tharkland or whatever. 
And when they get there, it's like it's a wonderful life. Only Tars Tarkas was the George Bailey of this movie because mm-hmm. the Sandman Thark is now in charge and the, the whole place has gone to hell. And Tars Tarkas is in prison and they throw John Carter in there and they're going to put him out into the Coliseum to fight what is, according to Ubo, not a white ape, although it looks like a white ape or gorilla. Yeah. No, I have the same thing in my notes where it's like, oh, these are white apes. Oh, no. Tars Tucka says, no, those aren't white apes. Those are bants. So they throw them in this arena. Uh-huh. And long story short, John Carter and Tars Tarkas kill these blind albino beasts. There's no reason to talk about what happens. It's yeah. just they're, they, they kill them and they survive. If you saw any commercial for john carter this is the scene you saw in the trailer so they kill him and then john carter's like i challenge you sin man alien to a battle and then the sandman alien he's like all right to hell with it let's fight he jumps out into the arena and john carter just chops the guy's head off real matter of fact like and he's like i'm now the leader of the aliens everybody my favorite part of this is when he challenges the sandman alien uh-huh the sandman alien is like wait you can't do that and he goes oh really because i'm the dotar soul jet come on everybody dotar soul jet dotar soul dotar, jet yeah. dotar, so- what does that mean huh? dotar i like to chant though let's get the wave going on Why? dude the crowd starts Why? chanting virginia like it's rocky four i figure if i can get along and you can get along <laughs> All of us can get along and we can go after the, the McNulty and save Deja Princess. Who's with me, everyone? And they're like, yeah. yeah. So all these four-legged aliens, they go to defend Helium in this big battle. And John Carter, again, a Confederate soldier, just a few days ago, they're going to go to Zadonga to kill the Mugwumps or the Thorn Snickers or the Vermicious Canits. I don't know what they're doing. There is a line here that feels like it should have been the big rousing moment where john carter says darks didn't cause the problems here on barsoom but by is we will end it and in a different movie i could see that being kind of inspiring but it's just you have no idea what john carter means to these people or what the they actual don't mean they don't even know politics of this planet are or anything like where do they fall in the pecking order it's all just a bunch of nonsense. they might be a horrible people i mean they may just have a history of genocide yeah and murder and rape he hasn't vetted these individuals no and in the book that is exactly Exactly who they are. He ends up killing all of what he perceives as being the bad guys, and then he turns around. He's like, "Ooh, <laughs> uh oh, oh!" So you guys aren't as cool as I thought you were. <laughs> Then we cut to the wedding taking place. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together. Love to love. <laughs> and so the, the dad is like, all right, honey, get all your shit. Uh, it's, yeah. not, it's not for you to go with McNulty. I wish your mother could be here to see this. You look just like a baby girl. You look, you look just like a. Uh. And McNulty is like, well, I always said if I was going to do this, I was only going to do this one time. And I'm a little <laughs> nervous. And Space Tucci shows up and is like, have no fear. Yeah, remember you're going to murder her soon the prize is not the princess the prize is barsoom oh yeah <laughs> whoops these tharks led by john carpenter john carter john carpenter john carpenter's ghost of mars right they burst into zadonga and find out that the wedding isn't there. It's actually in helium. And there's a real like egg on their face kind of moment. Yeah, Tars took us, gives like a slap upside the head to John Carter. Son of a, I told you to RSVP. They had one of two places where the wedding was taking place. And they went to the wrong one. Right. You fucked up. You trusted me. You didn't even think to call, did you? <laughs> I figured that the dad's paying for it. Why wouldn't he have it in his home turf? It's a moving city and i didn't even know if we were going to be able to find it and i figured it was going to be so hard to find because it moves around that it had to be there and not the one place that doesn't move at all it just sits there like a big old turd so john carter grabs one of the flying dragonfly things 
let's fly there. We'll get there real fast and we'll save Princess. And Tars Tukas says, listen, Spider-Man, it's suicide. And we don't fly. And John Carter says, well, if it's suicide, then I'll see you down the river is. That's something you guys say, right? Did I say that right? Is that something you guys say anyway i gotta go the wedding is now underway there's a big blue light shining down on mcnulty and princess deja and they're doing some kind of fancy schmancy you know ceremony with a goblet and some juice john carter he shows up and he, he crashes through the glass in the ceiling like he's benjamin braddock and he's, he's like it's a trap princess and now just immediately helium and zadonga are at war and if you're not paying attention you may have missed the fact that the forces of zadonga have surrounded helium and were waiting for some signal to attack which they okay. now do what do you mean if you missed it everybody missed it they don't explain that at all this movie is a master class in how to not tell a story it's a mess it could only be worse if everyone truly spoke their own individual language with no subtitles that would at least be interesting as an experiment if nothing else it would be like avant-garde cinema as opposed to avant poop record the dialogue and play it backward where it's like zip that zero yeah, that, right. Yeah, it's it's it, that. Like that scene from Top Secret, yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty good. It would at least a be weird a movie. like a moment of artistry. <laughs> you know? Something. Yeah, of like, oh, they filmed this entire movie backwards and it's fascinating on that level, if nothing else. Oh, but because this movie, again, makes no sense at all. Those green aliens that refuse to fly, they just crash land through the ceiling in an airship. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out they suck at landing, though, like the 9-11 pilots. And then the music is real upbeat, so you know we've got a fun action sequence going on. I can't believe I watched this movie twice. John Carter cuts McNulty from The Wire's arm off, which if you blink, you miss that. Because just a few seconds later, like, why is there an arm laying on the ground that's McNulty from The Wire size? And John Carter, after he cuts his arm off, says, you're going to tell me everything that you know about the therns. He says, okay. Yeah. And McNulty's like, yeah, all right, fine. And, and then the <laughs> blue shit that was on his arm climbs off of his arm onto McNulty's face. And it's like venom. Yeah. In the spider verse. And it crushes his head. R.I.P. McNulty from the wire. He's gone. Yeah. Killed by some blue shit. It's like blue shit on your wedding day. McNulty from the wire is going to the grave. Dude, it is one of the most like ignominious endings for a villain in a movie. Like John Carter didn't do it. It's just some random stuff. Like you have never seen this before. It is not like some ironic ending. It's just, oh, well, he's off the board now. <laughs> The same stuff goes after John Carter and Princess Deja sees this Thark dude manipulating his Apple Watch or something. Uh -huh. And she's like, hey, I have no experience about any of this, but I bet that Doc's up to no good. And he's already killed one husband of mine. He's not going to steal a second. And so she ends up cutting off his arm. Yeah. And it turns to her and it turns out that it is our space 2G mm -hmm. who has been having a real time of it between space dogs and princesses with swords. He has not been having a great week. No, his arm is definitely not having a great week. Yeah. And, and then space 2G shapeshifts into the princess. So now there's two of them and the, he takes the princess hostage. So it's a princess holding the other princess hostage, right? Is that here? Yeah. And I thought this was going to turn into a thing that's like, well, which one is which? But there's none of that because this movie is not even remotely clever about anything. And that just ends with Princess Deja ripping this medallion out of the clutches of the shape shifted princess and throwing it like it's the jewel at the beginning of temple of doom mm -hmm. and then the shapeshifter just magically disappears uh-huh and then john carter proposes to the princess and they get married there's the point where john carter shows up because tars took us finds the medallion and john oh, carter yeah, yeah, yeah. is like hey give me that medallion and he's like I don't know, Spider-Man. Something's fishy about this. And then it turns out that that's actually the space the Yeah. And so at the moment that 
Tars Tokas and John Carter are about to kill the fake John Carter. Fake John Carter just disappears. Which, did you think he disappeared with the medallion? Uh Uh-huh. But that's not what happened. Nope. He just disappears and the medallion gets left behind. That's right. Just, all right. At this point, John Carter says, hmm, hey, princess, will you marry me? And she says, yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Let's get married right now. There's a preacher over there. And they do. They get immediately married amidst all the rubble and death and carnage. Oh, I always wanted my wedding day to be special. And one of the most horrifying days in the history of our people sounds like the perfect day. So these two go and have wedding night space sex. John Carter gets up and walks out on the balcony. He's looking up at the sky. And Princess Deja comes over and she says, hey, you, pity for your thoughts, canoodle, canoodle. And he's like, oh, yeah, I was just thinking about my life's regrets why don't you go back to bed sweetheart whatever you say so she goes back to bed john carter wanders off into the night with space dog and uh, they're going through this big rock castle and he's got his amulet and he goes over and there's this guard and he walks up to him and then the guard like like gives him like a zip zap and it's space tucci bo yeah and space tucci just says i have something for you a one-way ticket back to Jasum. Bye-bye, John Carter. Mecca lecca hi, mecca hiney. Ho, bye-bye. And then, zoom, John Carter is sent back to Earth. Where he wakes up in this cave covered in dust with the skeletal remains of Brian Cranston sitting in the doorway. Is it? Yeah. It's gotta be, right? Yeah. It's like vulture-ravaged bones. Right, and he wakes up and he's like, Whoa, oh, son of a uh, Barsoom. Man, the missus is going to be in so pissed off at me. <laughs> he says the magic words to try to get back to Mars, but it doesn't work. And so then we get some voiceover to explain the beginning slash end of this movie. Uh-huh. Where he says, so I had to find a way back and I figured that if there was one gateway to Barsoom, there had to be more but also, I kept getting followed by all these Tucci's everywhere. They were traveling around Italy, trying some of the most decadent cuisine you can have on planet Earth. And I almost forgot a couple of times about my princess wife because I was so blown away by all the delicious pasta. And clean prostitutes, if you have enough money. He also says, like, much like The Matrix, you know, if my body dies on Earth, then I'm going to die on Mars. So what? Yeah, that turned out to be a thing. But I found some stuff and then I'm going back to Mars. So bye bye. And so Edgar Rice Burroughs is like, son of a bitch so did he go to mars and he rushes to this crypt and he figures out if he touches his name on the wording over the crypt it'll open this secret door but when he opens he the door that out he read the script <laughs> he's good at escape rooms too jeff uh i'll bet when the door opens up the crypt is empty but we see there's a Tucci sneaking up behind, and even the Tucci is like, wait a second, I thought he was going to be in there. But then John Carter steps out of the shadows and shoots the Tucci from behind like a hero. Sure, that's how you do it. Yeah, and he tells Edgar Rice Burroughs, like, well, I fake my death to lure one of these Tucci's out and get one of his medallions so I can get back. Thanks, buddy. My nephew? Cousin? Something. Son of a guy went to high school with anyway i'm going to this tomb so i can get back to that sweet sweet martian loving hey before i go though ned i got some advice for you you know take up a cause find someone to love maybe even write a book because that's irony that i'm telling you to write a book you're gonna write a book about all this but it's not the same because the book's really good and this is stupid anyway i'm going home Bye bye And so the end of this movie is John Carter holding the medallion and repeating the words, Mecca, lecca, hi, mecca, hiney, barsoom. And we get a last glimpse of the princess saying the the word barsoom. End of movie. So that's it. That's John Carter of Mars. Thank God. Yeah. It's my bottom. This is this movie is so bad. It deserved like all of the bad reviews and anybody who's apologetic for it, you're wrong. You're just trying to take a counterpoint that that cannot be taken, should not be taken. Will not be taken. I will not marry Magnolia from the wire. I will not marry him. <laughs> it's incredibly dull for all the stuff that happens in the movie, but it's just so lore heavy might be the way to put it where just it tries to pack so much shit into this movie 
that none of it matters. I mean, it's it's all a bunch of crazy names, which if you're kind of slowly rolling that stuff out through the course of a book, it's you kind of fun. You can't keep track of it. Not No, not in this context. That's the problem, is that if you're reading it, it's like, okay, well, 30 pages in, somebody mentions Barsoom or whatever. But it's not just nonsense like this and it's the worst it, like this movie is so so bad chad it's boring and confusing and the hero is bad like one thing we didn't really talk about a ton is that taylor kitsch is really bad in this he's a really yes. terrible villain but he's surrounded by so much other bad you don't notice it you <laughs> know what i mean it's like climbing into a dumpster and letting a fart <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right it's just garbage did this movie just end his career because he did this and what battleship was he in that yeah 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 yeah. that's a one-two punch right well and then he went on to do television and he's still doing tv work at this point but yeah he's done or with with starring in movies like this like maybe maybe somewhere down the line but no. It's interesting how you can be part of a movie that is so bad that it can just destroy your career. Speaking of which, Bo, Ooh. that leads me to episode four of this season's theme, Bombs Away, mm -hmm. where we are going to be exploring a movie that ended the career of one of my all-time favorite directors, Martin Brest. Also a director I like quite a bit, so yeah. Martin Brest? Yeah. Well. Beverly Hills Cop, Midnight Run, Scent of a Woman, yeah, and yeah. a little movie called Geely, starring Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez from the year 2003 when they were known as, uh, what were they called? Beckifer? Benifer. Lofezicon, Aflacage, Jafarkatars. <laughs> Ab <Some> abdominal, abominable. <laughs> something like that. Geely is a is is a interesting weird terrible awful movie that's badly written and badly acted but it's from a director who really is a talented guy and after this came out like kaiser sozebo he just disappeared yeah he's gone he hasn't given any interviews he's just absent so that's what we will be talking about in two weeks time i have never seen Geely. If you've never seen Geely and you don't know anything about it, you are in for such a treat because there are twists and turns in this movie that are, I mean, just sucker punches across the face of what is going on in this film. I'm looking if forward you haven't to seen it, it, check it out. It, I think Hulu has it right now for free. Don't cost you nothing but your time. And you are going to have a good time. I think John Carter's my bottom. Geely might be my top. It's terrible. Don't get me wrong. Okay, it is a bad, bad movie, but there are things in Geely that are just so head spinningly entertaining that I found myself just having a wonderfully awful, terrible time. And it also reinforced the fact that Ben Affleck is someone who I don't care for in movies genuinely. There are some things that he's done, like I think Jersey Girl, he was good in that. He's done a few other. What else did he do that was good? Maybe that's it. Yeah, no, I like Ben Affleck. I thought he was probably the best thing about that Batman versus Superman stuff we did. Agreed. I thought he was a good Bruce Wayne mm -hmm. slash Batman, but by and large, he's made a lot of not so good movies. And this one is not, not, not so good. Okay. Not, right. Right. not, not, not. All right. Not I'm with okay. you. Right. All right. So come back and see us in two weeks time as we will be taking on the 2003 disaster classic Geely. So any final thoughts that you have on John Carter from Mars? I won't marry pick six boobies. I shan't marry pick six boobies and I don't marry pick six boobies. Come on, baby girl. And just have a piece of cake. All right. Maybe you <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks, everybody.